Hello and welcome to yet another session. We are continuing to look at Virginia Woolf's essay, A Room of One's Own. In the first part, we have seen how she begins to talk about and then uh, eventually uh, uh, write an extended thesis, extended essay about women and uh, fiction and then she realizes that she needs to focus on the material conditions, on the social historical conditions and the financial uh, uh, allowances which would help women to write. And then she also looks at the contrasting images that are presented from Oxbridge which is a uh, uh, largely a male elite university and Fernham, the uh, college which she finds as uh, catering to women. She looks at the historical differences, she looks at the differences in funding and how certain kinds of situations, certain kinds of ambiences are made conducive only for male writers, only for men and uh, she finds women being excluded from these spaces in physical ways and financial ways and also in largely in historical ways. And in the second part of this essay, she is paying a visit to the British Museum and then she hopes that at the uh, outset of this uh, work, uh, let us also think about this fundamental premise where she is uh, experiencing all of these as this imaginary woman whom she chooses to call as Mary or we choose to call her and then she is taking herself to the British Museum and her experience is not radically different uh, here either and then much in alignment with the popular beliefs she is also asking if truth is not to be found on the shelves of the British Museum where I asked myself picking up a notebook and a pencil is truth. So she wants to know the reality about women and fiction. She hopes to get as much information as possible by going through these various annals of history which are uh, available to her in the British Museum. And thus she says, I set out in pursuit of truth. And now this is what she encounters over there. Have you any notion of how many books are written about women in the course of one year? Have you any notion of how many are written by men? Are you aware that you are perhaps the most discussed animal in the universe? Here had I come with a notebook and pencil proposing to spend a morning reading. Supposing that at the end of the morning I should have transferred the truth to my notebook but I should need to be a herd of elephants I thought and a wilderness of spiders desperately referring to the animals that are reputed longest lived and most multitudinously eyed to cope with all this. I should need claws of steel and beak of brass even to penetrate the husk. So that is a kind of material that she is, uh, uh, um, she, she is encountering. How shall I ever find the grains of truth embedded in all this mass of paper? Merely to read the titles suggested innumerable schoolmasters, innumerable clergymen mounting their platforms and pulpits and holding forth with loquacity with far exceed, which far exceeded the, the hour usually allotted to such a discourse on this one subject. It was a most strange phenomenon and apparently here I consulted the letter M, one confined to the male sex. Women do not write books about men, a fact that I could not help welcoming with relief. For I had first to read all that men have written about women and then all women have written about men. And then she realizes, why are women, judging from this catalogue, so much more interesting to men than men are to women? A very curious fact it seemed and my mind wandered to picture the lives of men who spend their time writing books about women, whether they were old or young, married or unmarried, red nosed or humpbacked, anyhow it was flattering vaguely to feel oneself the object of such attention provided. So she realizes initially with a lot of surprise and later she realizes the dangers inherent within it also. Much of what we know, what has been written about women, all of those works have been ordered by men. So the limitation is there in an inherent way but that has not been uh, historically visible and therein lies the danger of such a conclusion in trying to go to a place such as a British Museum where from where you find, from where you hope to find the truth that is how she puts it and this truth about women have been largely ordered by men and how reliable is that truth? How reliable is that data? How reliable is that information which is being circulated as truth? And from this she moves on to the other question about women and poverty. And this connection that she draws upon, the connection between women and fiction and the connection between women and poverty, that is something which underscores throughout this essay. And she continues to look through these various pages and she uh, hopes to find some iota of truth in order to pursue her argument but she realizes that she needs to find this information from within herself. It is an experiential journey that she is undertaking and in this, uh, uh, in this uh, 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 rather long essay, in this uh, rather long articulation she is also trying to tell the audience that women's experiences 
cannot perhaps be located from within history, from within the other kinds of knowledge systems that you are familiar with. One perhaps needs to travel along other uh, with uh, other women. One needs to experience it differently in order to be able to articulate it, in order to be able to find the truth, whatever that is, uh, within such experiences. Even towards the end of uh, the second part, uh, we realize that she's not really reached a conclusion. She is uh, still struggling to say the most appropriate thing about women and fiction the, the the final line says but what bearing has all this upon the subject of my paper women and fiction she also towards the end of the second part she realizes that we realize that she also talks about the various aspects of women's sexuality she talks about how domesticated women's feelings have been and then she begins to wonder she also begins to realize for herself and then the audience also perhaps begin to realize along with her that women and fiction is not a topic which can be dealt within the book within the uh, uh, within the uh, pages of a bound book it is something which extends outside and this extension could be either physical in terms of the many infrastructures and the many uh, support systems that would facilitate a writer it could also be very psychological in nature when you look inward into a woman's life into a woman's into the woman's experience in order to understand how the topic of women and fiction needs to be approached from different angles of, uh, physical uh, experiential, psychological, uh, economic, historical and uh, of course literary as well. And from this she moves on to the third section where she begins to wonder about the lives of women within the Elizabethan circumstances. For it is a perennial puzzle why no woman wrote a word of this extraordinary literature when every other man it seemed was capable of song or sonnet what were the conditions in which women lived. So she asks this uh, question and she herself is appalled at the lack of historical evidence supporting many of the arguments that she wants to pursue. I asked myself for fiction, imaginative uh, work that is not dropped like a pebble upon the ground as science may be. As uh, science may be, fiction is like a spider's web attached ever so lightly perhaps but still attached to life at all four corners and she begins to wonder what is it about the Elizabethan conditions, what is it about the conditions within England that did not allow a genius like Shakespeare to emerge from among the women. And she talks about these many characters that men have created. Shakespeare has created uh, Lady Macbeth, Cleopatra, then she talks about uh, not being a historian, one might even go further and say then she talks about Antigone, Cleopatra, Lady Macbeth, Cressida, Rosalind, Desdemona. So all of these are women characters created by men, but we do not find a woman writer as such emerging in these social conditions. If woman had no existence save in fiction written by men, one would imagine her a person of the utmost importance, very various, heroic and mean, splendid and sordid, infinitely beautiful and hideous in the extreme and as great as a man, something even greater. But this woman is fiction. And this is what something that she quotes from Professor Trevely and she realizes that this woman who exists only in fiction, these set of women who exist only in fiction, they were uh, perhaps locked up beaten and flung about the room and this is how she begins to talk about the perils of trying to locate woman uh, trying to locate a woman within this historical framework it exists only they exist only fictionally and now we begin to uh, realize the relevance of these many uh, extra literary concerns being uh, highlighted when uh, wolf uh, talks about women and fiction and she also realizes there are very few facts which are available about women. What one wants I thought and why does not some brilliant student at Newnham or Girton supply it and these are the two colleges where she have, had given this lecture is a mass of information. What age did she marry? How many children had she as a rule? What was the house like? Had she a room to herself? Did she do the cooking? Would she be likely to have a servant? All these facts lie somewhere presumably in parish registers and account books. The life of the average Elizabethan woman must be scattered about somewhere could one collect it and make a book of it. So it would be ambitious beyond my daring. She of course realizes that too. But she realizes that apart from these fictional accounts which have been largely narrated by men and that at best is still fictional too, she realizes that the real uh, lived experience of women, they are still scattered in different parts and it's an ambitious task to collate them and to present them as uh, authentic experience.
and she also talks about you know how impossible now it is to know what they did from 8 in the morning till 8 at night. They had no money evidently according to Professor Trevely and they were married whether they liked it or not before they were out of the nursery at 15 or 16 very likely. So this was the kind of uh, lives that women had been leading and they, look at the kind of conclusion that she's drawing from it. Cats do not would go to heaven, women cannot write the place of Shakespeare. It's as simple as that. It's illogical but it's also a certain kind of a conclusion based on which the society had been setting out their rules, based on which women had been uh, forced to uh, lead their lives. Now uh, we come to one of the most interesting sections in this essay where she talks about this imaginary sister that Shakespeare could have had. Let me imagine since facts are so hard to come by, what would have happened had Shakespeare had a wonderfully gifted sister called Judith, let's say. Shakespeare himself went very probably, his mother was an heiress to the grammar school where he may have learnt Latin, Ovid, Virgil, Horace and the elements of grammar and logic. He was, it is well known, a wild boy who poached rabbits, perhaps shot a deer and had rather sooner than he should have done to marry a woman in the neighborhood who bore him a child rather quickly than was right. So this is the kind of historical information that we also have about uh, Shakespeare. That escapade sent him to seek his fortune in London. He had it seemed a taste for the theatre. He began by holding horses at the stage door. Very soon he got to work in the theatre, became a successful actor and lived at the hub of the universe, a meeting everybody, knowing everybody, practicing his art on the bo boards exercising his wits in the streets and even getting access to the palace of the queen. So look at the kind of details that we have about Shakespeare. Look at the narrative which has been, uh, which has become so popular about Shakespeare, not really about what he has written, about the way which, uh, where the, about the road which took him to this place where he started writing, started performing plays. Meanwhile, his extraordinarily gifted sister, this is again imaginary, let us suppose, remained at home. She was as adventurous, as imaginative, as ag to see the world as he was, but she was not sent to school. She had no chance of learning grammar and logic, let alone of reading Horace and Virgil. She picked up a book now and then, one of her brothers perhaps, and read a few pages. But then her parents came in and told her to mend the stockings or mind the stew and not moon about with books and papers. They would have spoken sharply but kindly, for they were substantial people who knew the conditions of life for a woman and loved their daughter. So, this is more important over here, the conditions of a woman. It is regardless of in which family one is being born and brought up, regardless of the kind of uh, uh, conditions that the family could afford or not, it always depends not on the individual but on the conditions of life for a woman. And the family also, we realize, are expected to and they eventually end up acting accordingly. So this is perhaps one of the important matters that Virginia Woolf is also trying to pursue through this uh, line of thought, the argument that she is trying to pursue through this line of thought, trying to tell her audience that ultimately it is these social conditions which would make or unmake a writer. And for a woman, certain conditions are preset. So unless she breaks out of those set conditions, there is no way in which she could uh, emerge, she could blossom as a writer, even if she had been this mythical uh, sister that Shakespeare himself had. And she also talks about how this imaginary sister Judith, eventually she would be married away and her life would also eventually amount to almost uh, perhaps nothing and significantly not as famous as her brother uh, would become and her life also would become just as ordinary like any other lives and it would not be even be documented. But look at the kind of attention, historical, literary, uh, cultural and in, in this multifaceted attention that her brother receives on account of just being the male member of the family because there are a lot of conditions which uh, work towards the, his favour quite automatically as well. This is not to undercut the genius that these individual writers possess but to highlight the material conditions which would not perhaps allow a woman of similar gift uh, to uh, access or uh, give herself. She also talks about some issues related to class though very briefly. I think if a woman in Shakespeare's day had had Shakespeare's genius, but for my part I agree with the deceased Bishop, if such he was, it is unthinkable that any woman in Shakespeare's day should have had Shakespeare's genius. For genius like Shakespeare's is not born among labouring uneducated servile people, it was not born in England among the Saxons and the Britons, it is not born today among the working class. How then could it have been born among women whose work began almost before they went out of the nursery, who were forced to it by their parents and held to it by all the power of law and custom? 
So, she also talks about the intricacies of, uh, intricacies of gender and class over here. How all of these conditions come together in an, an almost a perfect neat way, almost to um, uh, ensure that women do not get to write at all. Then she makes this very compelling argument. Is that any woman born with a great gift in the 16th century would certainly have gone crazed, shot herself or ended her days in some lonely cottage outside the village, half which half visit feared and mocked it. She is also here referring to the many social customs, many religious customs which had uh, branded women as crazy, as witches, as uh, obnoxious beings, as objectionable uh, uh, beings within the family, within the society. She also says that perhaps these women were the talented ones who could not really break out of these customs and conditions which were preset in that uh, uh, in, in the uh, English society. In this entire uh, now, in this entire section, she continues to uh, pursue this line of argument and there are certain repetitions. She reiterates her point. She underscores uh, the uh, belief that she has that women cannot write unless the conditions also change because women's genius is uh, also dependent on the many ways in which the social conditions and the uh, moral conditions and the financial conditions change to such an extent that they would become more conducive at a personal level, at a domestic level and also at a larger societal nationalistic level. She also engages with some bit of um, literary history here and there to showcase this stark difference between how women writers and how men writers have been treated, how they have been recorded, how their histories have been presented and also about the many roads that they had to take before they could become a writer and how those journeys were facilitated more by the existing conditions and how these conditions were inherently hostile to women. So, with this we again now wrap up for today, uh, we shall look at the uh, remaining sections in the in tomorrow's sessions and also wrap it up. I thank you for listening, I thank you for your attention, I look forward to seeing you in the next session.